Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Bill McColgan. I'm from Mountain Lake PBS. We are so pleased to be here uh, for this conference this year to present uh, a special presentation about an upcoming series on Mountain Lake PBS called Rare Creatures of the Photo Arc. This is a series that is really going to focus on the work of National Geographic photographer Phil Sartori, who has been documenting endangered and threatened species around the planet <clears throat> for the last several years, has documented um, with breathtaking visuals more than 6,000 threatened species. Um, this is a, a really important part of our mission of education as well as entertainment, um, of telling the important stories of our planet and the important stories locally here in the Adirondacks, the Lake Champlain coast, and throughout our viewership region. This is the 40th anniversary of Mountain Lake PBS. It's a very important year for us. And in all of those years, I don't think there's been a more significant partnership than the one that we have had with the Adirondack Research Consortium in terms of uh, really focusing on things that are important in our natural environment. Our program today is uh, fairly straightforward. We're going to show you a uh, sneak preview of this three-part series that's going to be premiering in July. Uh, creatures of the Photo Arc, Rare with Phil Sartori. And then afterwards, Tom Halleck, uh, our host of Mountain Lake Journal, is going to bring on three local people who are on the front lines of environmental preservation and protection right here in our region. So thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this conference this year. And without any further ado, I'm going to show you the clip of Creatures of the Photo Arc. This, I think, is a really important three-part series that we're going to be presenting um, with our partners, WGBH in Boston, the producing company um, for this series, uh, beginning on July 18th. We are going to be supplementing that locally with stories uh, of a similar nature about you know what is being done uh, for threatened and endangered species right here in our own region. Stories which we will be presenting on Mountain Lake Journal and our uh, various uh, online platforms during the course of the summer. Um, this is an important uh, effort for us. We are um, pleased to be uh, partnering with uh, many great organizations um, and among them are the three that we've invited to uh, be part of this presentation. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and the Biodiversity Research Institute's Loon Preservation Program. Um, I'd now like to introduce our moderator, our senior producer and host of Mountain Lake Journal, Tom Howell. Good morning. If you enjoy nature, you're going to love this program when it comes in July. Uh, I think it's going to be really exciting, and it's really going to showcase uh, his efforts to protect endangered species. As Bill mentioned, we thought this would be a great opportunity for us this summer as well at Mountain Lake PBS to highlight the conservation and wildlife connectivity work uh, of uh, nonprofits in the Adirondacks, and we are so pleased to have three of them here with us today, and we're going to invite them up to uh, take part in a panel. We're going to hear about some of uh, their work that's going on right here in the Adirondacks. So we are happy to be joined by Alyssa Rafferty, who is the Wildlife Connectivity Project Manager for the Adirondack Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Nina Schock is the Executive Director of the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. And also, uh, McKaylee Glennon is the Science Coordinator for the Adirondack Program of the Wildlife Conservation Society. So ladies, if you would join us up here, we will get going. And while they're getting seated, speaking of uh, being in the right place at the right time to, to capture a fantastic photograph, I don't know if you folks uh, saw this one. 
uh, uh, well-known veterinarian from Fort Edward, uh, Dr. Gordon Elmers, captured this uh, last spring, uh, Route 113 in the Stillwater Easton area, I believe, an area known for uh, Bobcat Crossing, and he was at the right place at the right time with his camera, and not only caught one, he, he, he caught one and it stopped in the middle of the road and turned around and looked behind it, and he said he knew something was up. And then it growled, and then he waited. He said, you know, I'm going to wait a little longer, and I don't know how many minutes he waited, and this was the prize of him waiting a few more minutes. The pair crossing uh, Route 113 down in uh, Washington County or Saratoga County? I think Washington County. So, uh, fantastic photograph. That was, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. However you want to do it, we can we can do the uh, clicker. So uh, Alyssa Rafferty will start us off with the uh, Nature Conservancy. Great, thanks, John. And thanks to Ron Lake PBS for putting this session together. I'm really excited about it. Um, so today, I thought I would share um, just a brief overview of our wildlife connectivity work, um, and then touch on a specific project example that we're really excited to be working with Ron Lake PBS on documenting through a short film um, this summer. So first of all, for a bit of perspective, and because the Nature Conservancy <coughs> loves maps, um, this map shows the historic distribution of our forest type globally. And this is what is left today. Our forest type has been lost or degraded more than any major forest type in the world. Half was cleared to make way for farms and settlements, and most of what remains has been fragmented by roads and other development. So kind of a depressing start. But there is hope um, that we can keep our forests here intact and connected. You'll notice a lot of what is left is in the Adirondacks in the Northeast. So the Nature Conservancy is one of several dozen partners, um, including the Wildlife Conservation Society, working together across the Northeast and into Canada to keep forests connected for wildlife. So here, uh, the, so the yellow arrows on this map identify what we call linkage zones, connecting uh, larger, more intact blocks of forest. And here in the Adirondacks, we're working with many partners to maintain and enhance the connections to the Green Mountains in Vermont um, and the Tug Hill Plateau. And without these connections, areas even the size of the Adirondacks risk becoming isolated islands with implications for genetic diversity. So this becomes even more important as we think about climate change and the need for species to move freely in search of suitable habitat. And this is just one depiction of what some general migration patterns might look like. Uh, I believe this map was put together by the Nature Conservancy um, in Washington University. So to keep forests connected, we rely on four main strategies. Outright land protection, working with local communities on land use planning, working with transportation agencies to make roads safer for wildlife, and education and outreach. And all of this work is guided by science. So the linkage areas you saw at the beginning were derived through advanced computer modeling, uh, which is then supplemented with on-the-ground research like wildlife tracking and trail camera monitoring um, to narrow down the most important places. So now to the, the project we'll be working with Mountain Lake PBS on documenting. Um, this one happens to fall under our transportation strategy. So this is a... Um, a picture an artist drew for us of a critter shelf that we are installing this summer in the Black River Valley between the Adirondacks and Tug Hill. So one thing we're working with DOT on is taking advantage of the culverts that already exist under our roads and finding ways to make them more suitable for wildlife to use as safe passageways. So this particular culvert uh, is certainly big enough to allow animals to go through it but it's wet year-round, discouraging a lot of animals from using it. So while the ideal solution here would probably be to replace this culvert with a much larger culvert or bridge, 
that would also encompass the stream's natural banks, um, that's also really expensive. Plus, uh, the stream itself here is not being impacted and the culvert is in good condition. So one cost-effective solution is the shelf. It's a steel mesh platform um, that's bolted to the side of the culvert and removable. Um, and it's used for dry passage for animals like Bobcat and Fisher. So this is our first um, pilot project uh, for wildlife connectivity, especially of this kind with, with DOT. Um, so we're really excited to see how it goes. We're monitoring it currently with game cameras, um, and we will continue to do so after the shelf is installed to see how effective it is. So to wrap up, um, the shelf is just one example of the kinds of practical solutions we hope to be able to implement with our transportation partners. And by taking these small steps and working together, the goal is that these types of strategies, combined with other conservation actions, um, will allow us to stay connected, both for our benefit and that of wildlife across the region. And I couldn't help but end with my favorite uh, Bobcat video that actually Elizabeth Lee, who is here in the audience, helped me get um, in the Champlain Valley. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, aiming for this summer or fall right now uh, yes. for installation, and uh, we'll be doing a segment on that for Mountain Lake Journal. Uh, when that goes in and talking to Alyssa about uh, uh, whether there may be more to follow uh, coming in the interim next. Thank you. Uh, Michaela? Michaela Glennon now with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And let me just mention, we will be have some time at the end for questions. Uh, so once the presentations are done, we'll, uh, we'll take a few questions from the audience. program around wildlife. I hope that you're aware that the Wildlife Conservation Society is also the entity that runs the Bronx Zoo and the other zoos in the in New York Aquarium in New York City. But we are this strange hybrid of a marriage of cultural institutions in New York with a very large global field program and I represent a part of that. So WCS Adirondack program has been in the Adirondacks or headquartered in Sarnac Lake. We've been here for 20 some years. Um, doing two things really, applied science, I'm our science director, that part of it is, is what I focus most of my work on, and then a lot of community-based conservation as well. So I'm stru I structured this sort of around some, some broad goals or themes of things that we care about, um, one of which is intactness, this is some language from past vision documents that we wrote, but I think it's still really accurate in terms of the things that we care about and are striving to protect in the Adirondacks. So, one is just sort of the extent of this amazing habitat that we have it and trying to keep it and protect it in that state by avoiding and reducing negative consequences of habitat loss and, and fragmentation. So in, with respect to this particular issue, you know, one of the most critical decisions we make in this park and one of the most important uses of our private lands is where we live. And so we've spent about a decade um, investing in science to try to understand what the impact of residential development is on wildlife, and this is geared more towards sort of low density backcountry residential development, um, and how wildlife are impacted by it, and, and how we can sort of minimize those negative impacts. This is, by and large, field research that has taken place primarily in the Adirondacks with a variety of different species. Um, some of it has also done some comparative work between the Adirondacks and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to try and identify whether there are special qualities to our system that might make us more or less sensitive to these kinds of impacts. So we've invested a lot of time in this. Some of you have even been uh, very kind landowners and participated and tolerated us on your, on your land to study a bunch of things. But where we are at this point is really sort of more at the synthesis stage. 
wrapping up this work, um, getting it out there into the world, and, and trying to disseminate things like best management practices and brochures, tools for individual landowners and the planning community to try to take what we've learned from that work and, and implement it in a way that can be helpful. A second sort of broad theme or, or something that we care about in the park is not just you know the, the extent of habitat and maintaining it, but you know the quality of those places as well. So resilience, ecological integrity, the ability of our forested system to maintain itself in the face of stressors like fragmentation or other kinds of impacts that might be more indirect. This gets us a little bit more into the sorts of issues we face on our forest preserve lands where we don't have development per se, but we may have things like recreation that can also impact wildlife. So some examples of species with which we interact in that vein uh, include bears. Bears, um, we've been engaged with bears for a long time, primarily through education. We hire a couple of bear stewards every summer. We talk to hikers, mainly trying to get them to understand that we have bears, learn about bears and bear ecology, and to store their food in a way that minimizes the likelihood that they run into bears. <laughs> Um, loons is another example, and Nina can tell you much, much more about loons than I can, but another example of a species that um, is sensitive to a lot of things and, and can be negatively impacted by recreation, sort of directly through um, behavior of, of certain kinds of activities, but also indirectly through things like fishing line entanglement or ingestion of lead sinkers. Our engagement with loons primarily at this point is to run the what we call the loon census, the third Saturday in July each year a citizen science effort that engages hundreds of folks who go out and spend an hour counting rooms on lakes for us, which is a great way to index the population and also to do education around impacts to loons. And then a third example, and this gets us much more in the category of the truly rare, uh, is Bicknell's thrush. This is an endemic songbird in the Northeast. It's got an incredibly restricted range, both in its breeding distribution and in its winter distribution. And it lives on our highest peaks, above 2,800 feet, in nasty, horrible habitat that is not really any fun to work in, but that's where the bird loves to be. Um, and it happens to use one of our most heavily impacted mountaintops, of course, in the Adirondacks, which is, is Whiteface, where we have not just the amazing <coughs> ski center in the winter, but also all kinds of stuff going on in the summertime. So we've had a long history of working with Bicknell's thrush um, and working with Orta on Whiteface to try to understand all of the myriad things that Bicknell's encounters on that mountain, including the expansion of the ski trail system that took place a number of years ago, um, the repaving of the Memorial Highway summer ago, two summers ago, um, what happens when the 10th Mountain Division wants to use Whiteface as a training ground and, and land their helicopters up there, so we've spent a lot of time trying to understand how that may or may not impact the canal's thrush. Um, and then the last sort of broad theme is connectivity. As you just heard about um, from Melissa, this is something you know we care not just about the park itself and its its qualities and health, but make sure making sure that it's connected to a larger geography. This is something I think that is especially important in the era of climate change, where we have to think about how critters that inhabit this park may need to be connected to other places. And this gets us into engaging with some species that are really uh, sort of on their southern range extent here in the park because we're sitting at the sort of boundary between the boreal and the temperate forest zones. We've got some stuff that's unique <coughs> and interesting and, and we're, we're worried about what their future is. One example is boreal birds. We've been tracking a species, a group of about eight species of boreal birds for a decade or so. These are the super rare ones that all the bird geeks come here to find. Most people are not really aware of them, but, but there's some interesting species that are only in our sort of peatlands, sphagnum, Canada looking types of habitats. Um, we've been tracking them for a while, and unfortunately, most of them um, are, are in decline. And so we're interested in understanding what are the real drivers of that decline and what are our options to try to do anything about it. These are widespread northern Canadian birds that we just happen to, to have here. Um, and the last example is moose, whose distribution looks almost exactly the same as all of those birds. We're sort of not quite on the bottom of moose range, but certainly close to it. Um, and we've been engaged with moose for a number of years and, and still are in terms of both field research to try to figure out how many moose we have, where they are, how they're doing, um, what their health status is and, and what their future might be. But also, again, thinking about how do we make sure that moose, if they need to, can get to other places. And that gets us into the kind of work that Alyssa talked about. We've partnered with TNC and others in the Black River Valley. We've got some cameras on um, the homes of individual landowners trying to document whether moose or anything else are moving through that region. And 
and using some of those land use planning tools that we've developed to try to maintain connectivity for moose and other species. So that's a super brief picture of WCS and a handful of wildlife. I just want to mention that our director, Zoe Smith, is here, and our intern, Ricky Delahanty, is also here. They can tell you a lot more about our community-based work and also our cycle Adirondacks, which is coming up this summer. Thanks. Thank you, Michaela. And now Nina is going to talk more about uh, the iconic wilderness. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. I, um, I didn't bring any slides, so, I, um, so I'm just going to talk about the work we're doing with the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. And it has evolved from research that I started volunteering with back in 98, which is using loons as an indicator of how mercury pollution is impacting the aquatic ecosystems in the park. And um, now uh, we have become our own independent nonprofit just this winter. And we have expanded our research quite a bit. In addition to continuing the long-term uh, biotic mercury monitoring study, we now are looking at uh, factors impacting nesting success and the health of the loon population and the population status and, and trends in the population in collaboration with WCS's Adirondack program. And um, also, we've uh, become kind of a trifold mission where we're, we're have many different education programs out there. Um, one of the new things that we started last summer was the Loon Center in Saranac Lake, which is um, in addition to a retail store to help maintain the offices, we are developing uh, museum quality educational exhibits so that we can become a true hub of all things loon in the park, where people can come and learn about loon ecology and factors affecting their populations and, and what people can do to help loons and other wildlife in the park. We're using loons as an example. And also, we're um, starting to expand our internship and student training programs so that we're helping to develop the next level of conservationists for the Adirondacks and beyond. Um, and over the next few years, hopefully you'll see us uh, continue to collaborate with many organizations and, and schools, colleges throughout the park and in the North Country to greatly expand that program. Um, the other aspect of our work is uh, becoming more oriented toward conservation and management, um, where we've discovered over the years, when I first started doing this work, we had just a few calls here and there about, hey, there's a loon that has fishing line wrapped around it, or, you know, it's not acting right, can you come help us? And over the last five, ten years, we've now found that we have probably 30 to 50 calls a year with 20 to 30 loons needing rescue. Um, so part of our mission now is to help individual loons. The primary um, two causes of loons needing rescue are fishing line entanglement, um, the lead sinker ingestion, lead toxicity, and also uh, birds that uh, become iced in. And we're finding that as the, the winters shorten, um, that more loons are getting iced in in the winter. And that's because loons uh, lose all their flight feathers, um, like ducks do in the, in the summertime. Many ducks and geese completely molt out their flight feathers and are flightless for about a month. In loons, they do this in the winter, anywhere from January through February. And so if we have a late ice in or an early, um, sometimes the birds are unable to fly. And we, they are caught in a pool, a little puddle, maybe no bigger than this desk here, this table. And um, it becomes a, a very safety concern for both humans and the birds uh, to rescue these birds. Um, but fortunately, we've, we've had good success with that. And uh, we're also finding that that's happened elsewhere in the Northeast. We collaborate with several organizations throughout the Northeast. Um, to, we're developing a database on loon rescues and, and uh, that climate change is apparently a big factor in, in this situation. So um, we're addressing some of the human impacts to loons and also, again, because they're one of the iconic species of the Adirondacks, we're using them as an educational tool to inform people about the environment here and ecosystems 
and the wildlife that live here, how we can address human impacts to wildlife to minimize them. Um, and then I just wanted to say that I, one of the things that brought me to this far in my life is that I was inspired by several founding women um, in conservation. Uh, you know, as a child, I was <coughs> all about Jane Goodall and the chimps um, and, and Diane Fossey with the mountain gorillas and I was fascinated with these women. And then when I came to the Adirondacks, I was also inspired by Anne Lava Steele and her work with the Greaves down in Lake Adelon in Guatemala. And Judy McIntyre is the, uh, the matriarch of Loon Natural History. And she's done over 30 years of research on Stillwater Reservoir and um, in Minnesota. And one of our exhibits is going to be highlight her and her work. Uh, so I've been very fortunate to have gotten to learn about these people and have been inspired over the years to, to work in conservation and wildlife. And I hope that the work I'm doing now will help inspire others to continue to protect the environment. happy to have such a distinguished panel of uh, incredible women here today. So thank you all three for coming today. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. We do have a wireless microphone so we can come find you. Dan has it. So if you have a question, uh, please uh, stand up and uh, we'll take questions. about the platform for the critters crossing under the road. On the, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we okay. can. I'm wondering if you're, um, whether the animals will actually walk on this mesh. Are they going to be willing to walk on this? Um, are you putting burlap on it or anything to kind of make it less um, <coughs> <coughs> underfoot? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So this particular design um, actually comes from Montana. So it was developed years ago by um, an ecologist, Carrie Forsman, there in collaboration with the Montana Department of Transportation. And they tried several different versions um, and really studied it uh, for several years to try to get it right. Um, and so they've had success with it with mostly smaller mammals. Um, it does also have a little tube attached to it for the really small critters like mice and voles and, and whatnot. Um, so the, the one thing they did tell us though, um, they haven't had any canids use it. So um, his, his theory was that um, he's tried to convince his dog to go across it um, with no success and that seems to be the one um, that are leery of the, the mesh platform. So, but we hope that in the Black River Valley that um, it, it'll be used by a lot of small mammals and um, primarily bobcat and fisher, we hope, so. And Alyssa, could you tell us, it's along Route 12, right? Where exactly is it going to go? Yeah, so those of you that are familiar with that area, it's Route 12 is the busiest road in the linkage, kind of cuts the linkage north-south. Um, and it's right in the middle. It's in um, Alder Creek, between uh, just south of Boonville, pretty much. Thank you. All right. More questions? Just a second. Uh, uh, you have do you have a, a, a database on the on the mercury concentrations and their changes over time? Yes, we do. Um, in the loons, and then other organizations have it in the fish. Is that available? You have a website, correct? Uh, the website is uh, is up, um, but it's, it's a brand new website, and I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. I do have a couple reports on there, one that summarizes the work through 2007, and we'll be, um, in 2018, we'll have a, another set of field work, six years worth, that we're going to be summarizing, and it should be up by 2019. But happy to send you the publications. Dan, I think this is um, right up here. Uh, what do you do with the, the loons? Who, who, I'm sorry, I'm here. <laughs> just wondering what you do with the loons that have lost their flight feathers. Do you rehabilitate them or put them um, in the beach? So, <laughs> <laughs> so the birds that are iced in, uh, fortunately, Lake Champlain, for the most part, has been open in when we've been rescuing them. Um, and so we've transported them over to there. 
Uh, usually it's in January or December that we're having birds like this. And occasionally, um, two years ago, we had a bird that had a fishing lure that was caught in its wing that we tried to catch through the fall. And we just, we were unable to catch it. Every time it saw us out on the water at night, it would disappear completely. We had one chance at it and, and it never let us near it again. And uh, so we waited until that bird iced in and we finally caught it. And it did have a little abscess where the hook was attached. So we sent that bird down to Tufts Wildlife Clinic that has lots of experience with loons. And that bird did get released all, um, along the Boston River, along the rivers of Boston. So it, basically, the loons that need rescue, either they're released if they're in very good shape, um, or they're sent to a wildlife rehabilitator, or if they're near death, then we euthanize them and send them down for necropsy. Nina won't say it, so I will. I'll just mention that she's my neighbor, and more than once she has said to me, there's a such and such in my bathtub. Do you want to come and see it? <laughs> I don't know if there's ever a Luna, but certainly oh, yeah. ducks and grieves and things. So sometimes yeah. sometimes a bathtub is part of the operation. <laughs> Temporary. Just to make sure they can Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, 20, 24 years ago, if this panel had assembled, it probably would be all, all representing DEC up here, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation. So it's wonderful that 24 years, here, years later, I mean, we still have a DEC, oh. and we have the nonprofits that are, and the people that are so engaged in, in this important work in the park now um, assembled. And also, there would have been all men probably 24 years ago, also. Um, but my question is to all three of you is, since we still have a DEC, and um, their natural resources uh, budget is, is quite a bit less than it was 24 years ago, but they still have a natural resources budget and very disciplined and very dedicated people. How do you interact with the Department of Environmental Conservation? And what are your partnerships now? And what are your partnerships that you hope to aspire for in the future with DEC? He asked, we have the supervisor of natural resources in the region sitting right there. I know, that's why I asked the question. So I can, I can start. Um, with, uh, through our work with the Staying Connected Initiative, DEC is a formal partner, and I'm actually looking at Joe Reset right here, who is a part of that team. So um, we've worked really closely together um, on priorities and I sat down with Joe and looked at maps about where should we focus our tracking work, um, those, those types of things. So definitely uh, a very instrumental partner and, and will be going forward. And DOT obviously another partner. Yeah, well. yeah, the great thing about the Staying Connected Initiative is it's such a diverse group of partners. So it's a lot of nonprofits and conservation organizations but also um, local and, and state um, government agencies, DOTs, um, fish and wildlife, lots of them, so. Yeah, I can give some examples. Um, DEC has been incredibly great partner with us through the history of our better work. I think that because their capacity has been reduced and that's unfortunate, we don't see any change in that. I think there are some instances in which we can pick up on education and outreach where their staff just don't have the capacity to do that. And so we've partnered with them on our Black Bear program for a long time where they might have to go in and physically remove these bears if we can interact with hikers in the back country and the front country um, to try to do more of the education piece that they just might not be able to do. Um, we are currently working with DEC also on the big moose project that's going on. They're one of several partners that's involved in that work and very instrumental in it. And then the, the last example, um, Royal Birds, we got the original funding to start that Royal Bird work uh, was a state wildlife grant. And it was terrific because it gave us the opportunity to go out and just do baseline data collection, which nobody hardly gets to do anymore. And it's, it's resulted in what has now you know, developed into a 10 year long data set of, of you know, really important changes that we can see in bird communities and animals in the peatlands. And, and with the loon work, um, we partner extensively with New York State DEC uh, with the field research, with um, capturing and sampling the birds, um, and the management. But they provide staff and equipment on occasion to help with um, nest protection and, and loon rescues. 
and also, um, again, with the, the field work. On a personal level, being a wildlife veterinarian, I also help them on other projects, uh, such as the moose work and so on. And so um, our work in the Adirondacks, we wouldn't be able to do the research that we do and the management efforts that we do without our collaboration with the University of Tennessee. We're extremely grateful for our partnership. We have a, a formal volunteer stewardship team. Thanks. I'm Joe Rosette. I'm a DEC wildlife biologist. And in my opinion, sometime long ago, probably in the 1980s, there was a decision made for the DEC to do less research and allow academic institutions to conduct the research. So I think that's where the perception is that DEC is doing less. Is, is that was a, a decision of how to assign our staff and um, and allow the researchers to uh, do their work. We, we certainly issued the special licenses that they work under. Um, all of these, these women would uh, be able to name off half a dozen folks that have helped them uh, in conducting their work at DEC, as I said, with resources um, and the licensing. Um, so I, I think DEC is still very much involved in, in the, the work, but it's more administrative, more behind the scenes. We don't really have as many field staff as we used to have. Um, so uh, I, that may be a more efficient model of, of how to achieve the goals. Um, the real question for me is how do we take the results of this research and incorporate that into public policy? And DEC is first and foremost a regulatory agency. And, and so we need to have the policies uh, and the regulations that achieve the, the goals of the, the research, what the research is telling us, we need to bring into the policy arena. Thank you. Josh. Uh, so the relationship between farmers and wildlife is often a little contentious. Uh, are any of your organizations working with farmers to promote wildlife friendly practices or anything along those lines? So, did someone plan this question? <laughs> um, we are not at the moment, but very much interested in doing that. And we have a new director of our North America program who is really into food systems and has strongly encouraged us to try to go in that direction. So if you know anything about it, and we'd love to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. And we don't work specifically with farmers, but we have worked with um, lakeshore owners to develop guidelines for best practices for managing their shorelines for um, wildlife nesting habitat for nesting habitat. Uh, this is a question for Michaela. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, and this piggybacks off that a little bit. You, you referenced briefly in the presentation the study, or some of the studies you did a couple of years ago, and you completed one in um, our neighborhood of Keene, the sort of ex-urban part of the town. Um, moderate intensity, low intensity, bordering on resource management, and the impact of the footprints of our dwellings, our properties, on wildlife. I'm wondering if you could just speak sort of broadly about some of the things you found out. <laughs> I'll, I'll preface it by saying we still have mountains and mountains of data from that project that we have not been able to get to, and it's just a, you know, a multiple year endeavor to, to do the level of data analysis that that data set can enable us to do. Um, I will say that what we have found so far um, is similar to what we have found in other work, which is that you know, the, the impacts we see from residential development are similar in the Adirondacks as they are in other places all around the world. Um, there's nothing particularly different here except that we live in a landscape that's highly, highly protected, but we see the same sorts of changes within biological communities. It's challenging to describe those changes in ways that are super compelling to people because they're sort of subtle. It's not, um, you know, depending on, on how things are constructed and when it occurs. There can be direct mortality, for example, if you pave through a bunch of vernal pools. But what we see more often, and again, this is echoed in studies all over the world in all kinds of contexts, is a simplification of biological communities, where we tend to create 
um, habitats and, and environments that are suitable for certain kinds of species and less suitable for other kinds of species. And so as a community ecologist, I see this primarily as you bring in certain sorts of more common species that we just have lots and lots of, and we tend to drive out the species that are, that are sensitive. And the reason they're sensitive is because they are perhaps more rare numerically, perhaps uh, specific to very um, certain kinds of habitats or certain kinds of food sources. So again, it's, it's sort of subtle changes in biological communities that simplify them. And it's, you know, at one house in one location, big deal, maybe not many, many, many across the landscape over many, many years, then it does become a problem. And that's how we get to sort of a biodiversity crisis, the accumulated impacts of these changes over long periods of time. And that's why we care, and that's why we think it's worth trying to, to you know, as we make decisions about where we put houses on the landscape, how can we do it in a way that maintains the greatest amount of sort of intact habitat where we can have critters still doing what they need to do. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> As I was driving over here from Long Lake this morning, listening to NCPR, um, they commented on how the Adirondack Club and Resort seems to be a going concern again. Boxman has paid all his back taxes. Um, and I know that the, that is, am I right in remembering that WCS was um, very concerned about their plan because it, and it didn't allow for um, connectivity for wildlife. Can you comment, um, is that kind of what you were talking about just now? Or th this is connectivity on a very much smaller scale than what Toy Hill to began around there. Yeah, there were, there, were, there were two sort of issues there. One, is what, and the piece that we sort of got most closely involved with was what was being proposed on resource management lands, which are, you know, biologically in the park, really, really important. And, and there was, you know, it's it's a quite a spread out, large, large lot design. It's the sort that can, you know, take up a lot of space, and that's a that's a high concern to, to our organization and lots of other organizations. So that was the one piece. The piece that got a little bit more directly into connectivity, although there's definitely implications for connectivity in, in that part of it, um, which we didn't, we weren't too much involved in. Um, was proposed development that was actually more in the research or in the modern intensity red is that red. Um, around some some small lakes and there that levels of intensity of that and so that is where uh, Michael Clemens who also testified as a part of that uh, adjudicatory hearing highlighted the issue of you know if you bring this lake with with uh, the proposed development in the way that it was designed um, amphibians which is his specialty you know we're going to be totally blocked from the uplands that they need to migrate back so the issue of connectivity came up a little bit more with that particular piece on the modern intensity but it's definitely a, it's definitely a concern in the resource management too creating those long roads is going to sort of fragment things although there are some roads already on that property okay. any other questions if not we'll take this opportunity to thank our panelists very much For segments on their work in the coming weeks and months at Mountain Lake Journal, you can watch Mountain Lake Journal on Mountain Lake PBS on our website, uh, website mountainlake.org. Uh, just a quick mention coming up uh, tonight's program, uh, you can either watch it on air or online. Uh, we have a panel of experts talking about the uh, Constitutional Convention, and the vote coming up in November, tomorrow and in particular, Article tomorrow 14. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Where, um, it's, it's, not Friday. it's Friday. It's Friday night. <laughs> tomorrow night at eight. Uh, online tomorrow night at any time. Mountainlake.org. And uh, John Sheehan from the uh, Adirondack Council was one of our guests. Uh, and it's a pretty lively discussion, uh, in particular about Article 14 and and uh, the concerns about that. So uh, watch it on air or online if you can. And thank you very much for uh, having us uh, come here today. We appreciate the opportunity.